Joe Parsons, uh, general manager here at the Arthurian Centre. Uh, it used to be the family farm and we've now set up this Arthurian Centre uh, and we tell the stories of King Arthur and the history behind it all which uh, is as important as the legends around here. Actually the, the Camlan battle is, is said to have happened here. Um, the earliest writers named Arthur's last battle as Camlan and having happened on the River Camel here. Uh, but that battle used to be reenacted over at Tintagel. So um, when they actually stopped doing their reenactment, we decided to, uh, to take it over. So it's a way of bringing the public in and explaining Cornish history to them and uh, having a bit of fun at the same time. Uh, we are the group Ankerno, the Cornish. I'm the Jarl of this group, Ulf Ulixen. This is our sail tent, which uh, gives shelter to our warriors that are here to protect the traders and on the trade mission that we are on. This is the sail of the tent cast across cut poles and beams with weapons stacked, the shields, the, uh, the beds of our warriors, this is where they sleep, this is their mail, their shields, their armour and their weapons. Um, at the end we have the, the, my quarters, the Jarl, the rich quarters with a multi-layered bed covered by furs and the luxury uh, that is afforded to, to a leader. We travel to Cornwall from, uh, from afar. We cast our home pillars into the waters and we settled where they washed ashore in the lands of Kano that you people call Cornwall. And we work with the, the Cornish people. We are Anne Kerno, Dark Age, reenactment, fighting, battles, blood, merchants, and everything from the past. The Battle of Camlan was started many, many years ago by Iron Ed in Raven, but it's carried on, it's evolved. This is a, the new site. The old site used to be in Tintagel. Um, the weapons that we use are made... Sorry about that. The weapons that we used are replicas, but they are exact replicas of the ones that would have been used back then. As you can see on Martin, has a short sword. And a dagger. Okay. Okay. So, so the weapons we use, as I say, they are replicas of what they had. The only difference is nowadays we use them, um, they're made of modern materials. For the simple reason we were hitting the weapons against each other rather than a lot of time. Back then they would have, would have been taught to the edges, so they, they would have been trying to avoid the clash of swords so that the edges would have done the damage with the cutting and the slashing. But I say for obvious reasons, weapons are now made blunted. They're also made of a spring steel, which gives them the strength and the durability for what we do with them now and nowadays. And the other thing is we train every other week, every other Sunday. And the reason being, you have to be competent in what we do. This is a dangerous hobby that we do. People that we know, myself included, have broken ribs, fingers. Other people I know have had other serious injuries. But... The rewards are very, 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 very good. But the Lieutenant Arthur in Mordred, what we like to think of it is, it's a good old battle against good against evil, with obviously good triumphing. Arthur then, though mortally wounded, leaves this land, and then he will return at a time when the country needs him, when it's at its most peril. With a lot of artistic licensing, we can, yeah. you can put a lot of spin on a lot of the things. Everyone lo enjoys the Arthurian, and most people know a version of the Arthurian tale. So we just play on it for as much of your crowd's enjoyment, and just so that put on a show that people can enjoy and relate to, to know what's thing. A lot of the, there are a lot of other battles that happen and go on around the country. A couple of weeks ago, there was a battle of Tewkesbury, which is a, a, one of the Water Roses, where on a good year, there's often over a thousand people, participants on each side of the battlefield. Due to bad weather, obviously, this year was a bit smaller. Yeah. But so it's a large community, the reenactment community, and it spans a lot of age groups from, let's say, most combatants can't take the field until the 18. But let's say there are some societies that have got round it and they get involved the kids from earlier ages and standard bearing and other things. And if you were to just have a look around some of the authentic tents and some of the traders, uh, you can buy the equipment from them. They buy it from other people who specialise in making the equipment. Uh, the armour here that he's wearing was made by Dave Woody. Uh, exceptionally gifted armourer. <coughs> high, high quality. 
Same with the weapons. You pay good money, you got a product which will last you a long time and save you a lot of injury. All the armour again is made to measure so that you've got the ability to and the freedom of movement with the ability to take the shots. If some, we train not to hurt each other, but again, accidents and they've heavy hand, this does happen. If someone moves where, from where the shot you've chosen to put it, you can't always pull that shot to the point of being safety. So the armour does get dented, it does get scratched up. But it's there for the looks, the protection, so that we can all go home the following day and go back to our normal jobs and our way of lives. Hi, yeah, I'm uh, Terry English. Um, I make armour and stuff for films uh, over the last 50 years. Uh, films like Excalibur and King Arthur. Um, just currently I'm working on the latest Thor film, which is a bit exciting. And uh, yeah, just came here for the day, heard the battle thing was going on, and uh, meet good people here. And it's fun, you know. So, so how, how did you get into making armour and stuff like that? Oh. Did it, it was back in about 1962 and uh, I worked as a, a theatrical metal worker making crowns and swords and stuff. Um, I mean, it dates me a bit, but it was in the days of Dot Shivago, I worked on that film and Lawrence of Arabia, Charge of the Light Brigade. Um, but it was through repairing the old stock of armour they had, I learned to make it and I formed my own company. Um, it was like 40 odd years ago, and um, here I am still doing it, just one film after another. <laughs> so, um, if, if people want to see some of your stuff in it, is there anywhere they can go to like see some of the armour you've made? Not really, I did have uh, all the original Excalibur armours, which I still have, um, they were displayed in London, but that's now been taken apart. Um, but there are, uh, I'm currently maybe selling those, so um, hopefully they're going to go into another museum and uh, people can see them, hopefully. So uh, how, long does it, how long does it sort of take to make a full, say a full set of armour <laughs> for somebody? <laughs> it kind of depends how much they pay me. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I think the world record was um, I made a full suit for um, John Reno for a film called Just Visiting, and I did that in 24 hours. But that was back-breaking work, it literally was 24 hours work. Yeah. Yeah. And I got onto set with it just after I put the last rivet in and they filmed on it. Yeah. My name's Derek and this is uh, my partner Helen and this is our, our uh, stall. Uh, we come from Devon, just outside of Honiton and travel all around Britain to different medieval fairs and exhibitions and shows and do what we do. Um, Helen plays the harp. We uh, sell some historic instruments as well. Um, What's the oldest kind of instrument you've got? The, the oldest we have is um, it's called a rebec. It's an early form of a violin. Three strings. So what sort of era is that from? That is from the 14th century. But it does date back to the 8th. We're Albion Falconry. We're from Hampshire in the United Kingdom. These are a small collection of our birds. We try to do historical falconry, always accurate from the historical text. We train all of our birds using historical methods. This one here is the Saker Falcon. He is often flown by the Arabs. Uh, they've been flown for over 2,000 years in the Arabic parts. We've got at the back there the Lana Falcon. They were flown in the Crusades, they were brought back by the Crusading Knights. Very, very popular birds, but very tricky and difficult to fly. Down here we've got everybody's favourite, the Peregrine Falcon. She is our largest native falcon in the UK. She was flown historically through um, all of the ages by princes and earls and men of the highest rank. And right at the very back, We've got the little kestrel who was flown by knaves and trainee falconers. They were thought to be the best birds for a trainee falconer. Very, very friendly little birds but quite stubborn. And right at the very back we've got a Rawn who's a goshawk. He's a rescued bird. He's wearing a tail guard at the moment to protect his new feathers that are growing. And Andy there, the other falconer who I work with, is holding a common buzzard. She's the one that you will often see flying above the roadside, soaring very high up in the air. All of these birds were used for various purposes throughout the medieval times. And we are flying them, we've flown them here today to show people what medieval falconry was really like. 
The, the reason for the, the site being part of the, the Cornish history that we're telling is that um, King Arthur's Stone is a 6th century monument to a, a British leader who did die on this site, uh, dated to about 540 AD, and that is the right date for King Arthur's last battle. So we know that something happened here which led to the stories of Arthur's last battle being set on this site. Uh, something happened and we have the stone to prove that somebody of importance lived in this area. Um, what we're now doing is linking other historic sites around the area, using our archaeologists on site to come and investigate those and tell the whole story of North Cornwall. Uh, these, none of these sites are, are individual, they all tie in. There's Tintagel on the coast, a major trading port in the 6th century, and then there's this site in, slightly inland. Um, and we're trying to sort of bring more and more of the North Cornish history to life. About as close as you get with King Arthur to, to getting a site that is the right date and the right place and the earliest chroniclers and writers identified this site as the last battle site. But they didn't actually have the stone, interestingly, as, as evidence. It wasn't mentioned until 1602. So there must have been a memory of the story and there must have been local folklore that, that led people to this site. And then a 6th century memorial stone was found as well. Um, the earliest writer to really identify the site was Geoffrey of Monmouth in 1136 and he was also the first to mention Avalon as the place that Arthur was taken to after the last battle. Um, and it just happens to be that this site was known as Gerd Avalon in, uh, in 1066 when the Doomsday Book was compiled. Um, they named it and it's a Cornish word meaning the place of apples. So we believe, and this is a first for TV, that um, the, the last battle happened here and the, the person, Arthur, was taken to Avalon, but actually not a long way away. It was all within the, the sort of local area. We have um, displays of some of the, the archaeology finds. Um, we also get the archaeologists back every summer. We've now put in a lot more facilities for the students so they can come back um, earlier in the year and stay later in the year. Uh, with the, the weather we've had earlier this year, it's quite nice to give them some facilities on site. So um, we're gradually adding more and more for them. They can then go out and look at other sites in the area. And we have finds on display here. We have just this week we found a nine men's Morris board, which is a, like a little checkers board, which somebody had carved 800 years ago, and, and that turned up this week. Plus a Roman co coin nearby, not on this site, but you know, a very early Roman coin. And we're, we're starting to find out that the Romans were in North Cornwall. Um, and, and hopefully we can start telling that story as well.